So good, good evening, everybody. I am David Hobday. I am chair of the uh, board for the Bath Bid. I'm very pleased to welcome you all to this evening's spring meeting of the Bath Bid. This evening also marks our official launch of um, the third five-year term for the Bath Bid. And I'd like to thank our levy payers in particular for supporting us through uh, the re renewal process. Um, now, this evening, we're going to hear a lot more about um, the third term from our chief executive, Alison Herbert, and I'm very happy to report that we will be um, uh, listening to a number of presentations from representatives of a number of um, uh, the BIDS partners. Uh, and I'd just like to thank all the presenters in, in advance for, for uh, supporting this evening. That's uh, very, very much uh, appreciated. And I feel we start our third term at what is essentially a very auspicious time, given, given that we're working in parallel uh, with uh, the uh, ending of lockdown. And given the great strength of our city, I really believe that we can be optimistic about the future for Bath. Of course, that's not to say that many city-based businesses will still be facing quite challenging conditions for um, some time to come. And we're very conscious that there is a need for the bid to play its part in uh, supporting the reopening of Bath and the recovery of Bath's economy. As you'll hear more from Alison, we will focus very hard on the brilliant basics, the things that the bid delivers on a day-to-day -day basis that makes the city a really welcoming, safe and vibrant place to be. We will make sure that Bath is a smart city by supporting the use of technology we've helped to create. And that, and that will help us en enhance even further our understanding of the city's performance. We will work in partnership with organizations like the council, the college, the universities, schools, and other organizations to make sure that we are a truly connected city. So for example, we will support people here uh, to have the knowledge and the skills that um, Bath businesses need. And we will play a much more strategic role in promoting the Bath brand, even encouraging inward investment and influencing new businesses to be based in the city. All of these things, of course, are what will make Bath a successful city. The bid's purpose is to make Bath a better place. Fundamentally, that is about making Bath a great place for business. But our approach will be to work on the whole community so that Bath is a truly inclusive place for its residents, for the people who live here, as well as for its visitors. And with that, I would like to hand over to uh, Alison. Thank you. Hello. Um... Thank you all for coming along. Feels like um, I keep reading articles about people having webinar fatigue. And um, I'm really hoping that this is the last time we have to do this kind of meeting in this kind of way. I'm really looking forward to seeing people's faces and uh, um, actually interacting in a kind of more meaningful way. But nevertheless, I'm very grateful to you all for taking the trouble to switch on your computers and, and join us um, in, this, in this way. Um, and for this evening's presentation, I focused on a bit of looking back and a bit of looking forward, I guess. And then um, we've lined up what I hope you'll find. some. I've, what, I've seen the slides, some really interesting presentations. We wanted to bring together some speakers who it would help us all to feel really positive about the reopening um, because uh, that's the only way that we're going to get through it is by being positive and, and doing things together. So my first slide is a lovely infographic um, and it's the highlights. What a year it's been. Um, everything that we had planned for this year went out the window and we turned into a very reactive and responsive organisation, um, uh, much as you all had to. Um, and uh, so I'd just like to pick out a couple of these. Uh, I love the fact that we completed 4,071 ranger jobs in this financial year. Not, um, despite the fact that we had some rangers on furlough and uh, there were all sorts of other things at play, it's still 28% more than last year. So 
we continue to improve the services that we're that we're offering and and to look for you know streamlining and better record keeping and all of that stuff so i'm i'm just wanted to point that one out to you and again even though the city was locked down for huge chunks of the year we still helped two and a half thousand visitors um with our with our welcome ambassadors much loved and we can't wait to see them back in the city some of them are on the call this evening it's lovely to see you um and we did our bit to try and get people back into your shops when they'll be able to by by promoting the sale of gift cards and we actually sold forty one thousand pounds worth of gift cards so that's very much bringing trade that will end up in your shops online i feel like that's one of the key ways that the gift card is that we can sort of beat the internet if you like or at least you know give it a give it a bit of a challenge um, and then a couple of new things that, that we did because just because of the, of the situation, because of the lockdown. So that I just like to point out. So the seven day a week morning and evening security checks have been, um, we know, really important to some businesses. It, invariably, when you go around in the morning, there's somebody's alarm going off. There's nobody on site. We've had a fire that we've, we've got in touch with people about. There's, um, there's been a break in. So and we've been able to alert people really early in the day to those situations and that's something that um, I'm really proud the Rangers kind of managed to pull that off and that's been every single day of the week throughout lockdown. Um, so in your absence we've still been looking after your premises um, and then the Welcome to Bath website is brand new and 33,000 visits or well, nearly 34,000 for a website that only launched in November is something that I'm really proud of and they have to definitely congratulate Emily Mackay from who's new to the team um, for that piece of work it's um it's really starting to work and connected to that obviously we launched it to do the Christmas light trail which was uh relatively small in the scale of Christmas lights and 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 light trails it wasn't the huge festival that I've been fantasizing about for a couple of years but it was a great start and it was a good way to launch our website um, and people did seem to really enjoy it at a time when we couldn't be promoting big events we just had to do something small so that's the highlights of the year a bit of looking back um, and uh, I'm really proud of the work that the team's done I think we've really pulled together and I, it's been a horrible year for all of you and I do hope that in some small way we've helped to make it a bit a bit easier and I think perhaps the culmination of the year in that fantastic ballot result means that um, you did appreciate what we've done and, and thank you for that. So next slide, please, in, in, in the way that we do. So just a brief financial update, um, mainly for those of you in the room who are actually levy payers, but we, we, we did a massively scaled back budget um, on what we would normally expect. Um, and we've actually um, got almost 100,000 more income than we budgeted for, which is good news. Um, it meant that we could increase our expenditure as well. Um, but we've also now got a, a greater surplus than we anticipated, which puts us in a strong position for this year um, going forward. What it means is we won't, be, we won't be needing to bill you until June. So you won't get your levy payer bills until, until the beginning of June. And there'll be a 25% reduction on those bills so we'll use up that underspend from the previous year because I'm some of you I wrote to you might you might remember that the regulations don't allow us to change the way that we charge in the middle of the in the middle of the cycle. So what we did is took the opportunity when you were voting anyway to up to to put in that we would reduce it in year one and potentially in year two if the if the situation carries on. Delivering the same amount of work for less money that's got to be good. All right. Um, next slide. So what did we do in COVID? I mean, I hope that you're all aware, but um, responding to the emergency, that was that kind of first phase. We increased the amount of communications. We stepped up our partnership work and we um, fed information back to the government, which is a really important role of the bid, that coordinating your information back to the government, which makes an impact, I think, on, on the decisions that they made. We lobbied about, um, about the support given to the hospitality sector and that sort of thing. And of course, we carried on with our emergency services, focusing on the public areas, the cleansing of the public areas and um, 
and supporting those businesses that were able to be open. And then, you know, reopening, uh, um, that was very much about coordination um, and, and launching the Welcome to Bath website. And, um, and we did some webinars and of course, our lovely rainbow stickers that are being replaced as we speak with new Welcome to Bath stickers um, for the next reopening. And then, um, and then finally in the recovery period, so we've had the first recovery, I suppose, and then now the second recovery, let's hope it stays a bit, a bit more stable after this recovery period that we're hopefully going back into. But that was, you know, the lovely bounce back art competition that we did, the Bath at Christmas campaign, welcoming people back, working on Rediscover Bath with Visit Bath and, and really making, making the most of the opportunity to have people back in the city. So, Looking forward to the next five year term, these are the guys who are going to deliver the business plan that hopefully you've all seen, but if you haven't, it's available on the website. Um, this is our wonderful team of uh, rangers and office staff. Um, and, um, and then if I could have the next slide, this is the people who, um, who guide our work. Um, so this is our board and you'll see if you look, you can find it on the website, but if you look, um, the, we've got representatives from different sizes of businesses and different types of businesses. So office sector businesses, hospitality businesses, we've got the hotel on there and leisure, we've got Bath Rugby, and then we've got high street businesses. So, you know, shops and restaurants, and then partner partners like um, Bath Spa University and of course the council to whom um, we're very grateful for the resource that, you know, they've given us in the form of David Trithui and, and Dina Romero. So, um, do go and have a look. If, if they represent your area, either geographically or in your particular field of interest, then it's absolutely fine for you to get in touch with the board. We are going to do a meet the board sort of um, speed dating type event um, in sort of June, July time. So hopefully it'll be more, <laughs> less stressful than speed dating and more fun. But um, uh, if you've got um, an issue that you think you'd like to talk to one of the board about then do please send us an email just to the bid office and we'll forward it to them they are there as your representatives um, in in this organization so next slide so david talked about this our priorities we kind of put them in this pyramid heavily borrowed from many other pyramids you may have seen um, where we look at the you know the brilliant basics improving and new projects and the brilliant basics we just wanted to really emphasize we're not planning to take anything away from the the bits of our services that you love so the brilliant basics is you know that responsive and planned cleaning um, that the rangers carry out we're keeping the rangers they are having new uniforms because their current uniforms are looking quite grubby um, and it's nice to celebrate a, a new five-year plan with some nice new uniforms we're going to carry on with the Trade West discount. We're going to carry on with the Welcome Ambassadors and the City Motion and um, Business Intelligence, because obviously that's all about understanding the impact of what happens in the city and helping you to prepare. And then we think there's some things we can do better. So we want to do, we want, we know we need to develop the Trade Waste Partnership um, because the legislation is changing and people are getting more and more <coughs> demanding of the Trade Waste um, contract it's got to be better it's got to be more environmentally sustainable it's got to be more efficient um, and uh, it's got to maintain its great price point so it's quite a challenge and we're already um, starting those conversations we want to have more tap to donate points um, and we want to carry on um, uh, developing the welcome to bath event and looking at um, empty shops and the streetscape which we're doing in partnership with bath and northeast somerset council and then new projects. So the new one, the big important one is the one we're calling safe and secure. Um, the, the rest of it are relatively small projects, but safe and secure will be a new business crime partnership for Bath. Um, the current business crime partnership has now closed and we would like, um, we know it's really important to businesses of, across the spectrum, not just the retailers and the hospitality businesses to to have a safe and welcoming environment so we'll we'll be working on you know radios for you to con contact each other and and seven day a week marshals who are there to respond to 
um, either reassuring type issues or actual, you know, events that you might have in your business like shoplifting. So that was a kind of whistle stop uh, version of our five year plan. And um, you can read it, um, as I said. Um, and if you've got any questions about it, there will be an opportunity for questions and answers at the end. And um, we've left quite a lot of time at the end. So we'll either finish very early or, or we can have a really heated debate. You're, you're very welcome um, to ask questions. And if you use the, the question and answer function during the, um, during the meeting, then um, we can make sure that that goes smoothly at the point at which we get to questions. Okay, uh, next slide. So I'm now going to hand over to um, my colleague, Suzanne, who um, we've been meeting twice a week almost through the whole lockdown period where, where we update everybody and each other on what's going on. And, um, and Suzanne is, is going to give you a coronavirus roadmap, which sounds like a place I don't want to go. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Alison. Um, right, so just before I, I, I do begin, um, I'd like to just uh, give you a bit of good news, really. Um, we heard this morning that uh, the actual uh, coronavirus uh, rate uh, in Baines this last week is down to, to nine cases per 100,000. Um, and putting that in context, we're actually, the I think, probably one of the lowest... Uh, authorities um, in the country now, which is which is a real achievement. Um, it went exceedingly high, obviously, last uh, September, between September and uh, November, uh, and steadily increased. It has been coming down for some time. It was sort of sticking at around uh, 20 cases per 100,000. So to get it down to, um, to below 10, as I say, I, is, a, is a huge achievement. Uh, and even better news is that our rate in our over 60s is now down to two cases per 100,000, which I think just demonstrates the, uh, the benefit uh, that the vaccination programme um, is having um, to our uh, more elderly population. Uh, and the uptake for vaccinations uh, across uh, Bath and North East Somerset is exceedingly high. So, you know, if you haven't yet had um, your jab, if you've been called for it, I would suggest that you uh, you go and get it as soon as possible, um, because you know uh, it's really helping us to um, to bring those numbers down. So, on that okay, uh, on that a good note, uh, I then come on to uh, tell you a little bit about um, the roadmap. So. As you will have heard at the Prime Minister yesterday, he announced that we will be going to step two uh, next Monday, the 12th of April, which means that a number of businesses will be allowed to reopen. Um, and that includes all essential, non-essential retail uh, or personal care businesses, the hairdressers and nail salons. Um, public buildings, so your libraries and community centres, gyms, um, for use by people training on their own uh, or in household groups. So unfortunately, we won't be having any uh, exercise classes just yet. Uh, outdoor attractions can reopen. Self-contained holiday accommodation uh, can reopen. And hospitality venues, so that's your pubs and your restaurants and cafes, they can reopen, but they have to serve food uh, and drink uh, outside only. Can I have the next slide, please? There are a number of differences. Um, so one of the things that will be changing uh, is collection of contact details. So you will be aware that certain venues by law are required to uh, collect contact details. So anybody in, in hospitality venues or in gyms where people are spending time, uh, they must, you must collect uh, contact details. Now before, uh, in the previous tier structure, uh, you were allowed to take just one booking for a group of up to six people. Uh, but now, uh, or from next week, uh, you will have to collect details from everybody who is part of that group. 
Um, this is because the con national con uh, uh, contact tracing uh, uh, is moving away from actually looking at what individuals to looking at trying to identify establishments where uh, problems exist. And so therefore we need to collect as much information as possible um, about uh, people's contact details. And just to, oh, sorry, can I just go back again? Sorry. Um, one of the things that uh, you should uh, also need to, I'm sorry, I just made a different. Um, there will be a new QR code uh, poster, I understand, that will be, um, uh, that will be shared for those businesses that uh, legally are required to display it. Um, and again, just to remind you that you also have to keep a logbook for those people who don't have access to smartphones and can't use the QR code. And you should retain the contact details of those uh, customers for 21 days. And after that, those details, those hard physical copies must be destroyed. Okay, thank you. Next slide. Another thing that is changing or is remaining is the, uh, the ability uh, for shops to be able to stay open later uh, between, uh, oh, sorry, up to 10 p.m. Monday to Saturday, um, obviously to, to help boost uh, sales, to make sure that shops are open longer so that uh, it reduces uh, social distancing and people have an opportunity to shop in more quieter times. So again, just uh, just to, to, to cap, uh, recap on some of the things about hospitality, um, you will have heard that uh, you can only sell um, food and drink outdoors. So the premises must remain closed to members of the public indoors. Uh, the only thing that you can use are the toilets and baby changing or feeding facilities indoors. So that does mean for licensed premises where you're selling alcohol, that all orders must be placed and paid for outside the premises. Now, there is some debate as to whether or not that means you can go to the doorway of the um, of the premises in order to, to pay, because I appreciate that when you're using electronic payments, because we, we want to encourage people to pay by card rather than by cash, um, you know, it, that does uh, mean some people are restricted to how far, uh, or where they can take payments. Um, but please be aware, people should not be going inside the premises, inside the premises selling alcohol uh, in order to pay their bill. Um, and there is also some talk about um, a bit of confusion where some businesses uh, have produced their own QR codes uh, for collection of data um, in order to buy and uh, pay for um, goods. So I think Weatherspoons is one of those that has uh, their own QR code, uh, as do Boston Tea Party. Um, so it must be clear uh, that that is uh, separate to the national uh, NHS um, QR code as well. However, those premises that don't sell alcohol, so uh, a cafe uh, or a takeaway uh, premise, uh, people can go inside to place their order and to pay, but they must consume the goods outside. Um, Again, weddings and funerals, um, the numbers uh, participating in those events, again, weddings, it's going to be restricted to 15 persons for the time being and funerals, not more than 30. I think that's all I've got to say on that, but I, I, there's just a few things I would like just to, um, uh, to mention uh, as well, things that remain the same. Uh, you should still display a notice uh, requiring people to wear face coverings inside of shops. Um, 
Can I also suggest that your staff be encouraged not to wear face shields on their own? Uh, they are not regarded as being a face covering. It has to be a, a, a mask that covers the mouth and the nose. The shields are there to protect the eyes uh, from droplets. So um, face shields themselves are not acceptable on their own. Social distancing requirements still remain in place. So where at all possible, people should be two metres apart. Um, but there is also a requirement now in shops to increase ventilation. Now, more guidance is going to be issued on that by the health and safety executive. But in the short term, you know, you should be keeping doors and windows in shops open as much as possible. And can I remind people that um, the numbers of people within the shops haven't changed. So the, the COVID uh, risk assessment requirements that are set out by the health and safety executive have not changed. So people, um, you know, you must make sure that you limit the number of people in the premises uh, for the time being, at least. Um, and then the other thing I would strongly advise is that um, there, you may have heard as well in the news that from Friday of this week, uh, lateral flow tests, that's the, um, the instant half, you know, uh, COVID test that, that gives you a result within 30 minutes, will be available to everybody. Um, at the moment, it is only available to those people who have to leave their house to go to work. Uh, or to um, school-aged children uh, and uh, their parents. When I say, sorry, school-aged children, I mean those at secondary school. But uh, from Friday this week, more test kits will be available. Um, you can go to collect them from a carpenter house in Bath. Um, and... Basically, what we're saying is, or what you, you're advised to do, is to do one of these lateral flow tests twice a week. Um, it's, not, it's, it's not a requirement to do it, um, but it's, we're strongly advising everybody to try and uh, do these, Q, uh, these lateral flow tests as, as um, frequently as possible. Let's say to do it two, twice a week. Um, if you have a positive lateral flow test, you should then follow that up with a uh, PCR test, which is the one at that Carpenter House where somebody actually uh, assists you to do the test and it's sent away for, uh, for checking. Um, because if you need to self-isolate uh, and you need to uh, rely on the hardship payments, uh, you need that confirmatory PCR test in order to claim that benefit. Um, so I think that that's it from me. I don't know if anybody's got any uh, any questions or they want to do those at thank, the end, Alison. Thank you, Suzanne. Suzanne, there are a few questions. It's probably worth just picking them up as we go along. Um, okay. So uh, so if you, on the Q&A chat, we've had, I think the first question was in relation to collecting uh, data from customers and the question was does that apply to self-catering holiday lets yes thank you <laughs> so any uh, any but where you where you are um uh you know where you're taking a booking for a premise then yes you must take uh, all their details yeah not so if it's usually a family then you know that that's not too bad but um i appreciate that some uh self-contained units might take groups of up to six individual people and they will need to collect all of their details yes thank you Suzanne and then there's a question in relation to the lateral flow tests um, which I believe the apex are doing for people that um, need, need yes, to that's have correct. that is it, is it possible to con continue to book slots there or does that become a walk-in facility uh, no you have to book slots there but you can go and collect kits that, as I say, from Carpenter House in the afternoon that you can then take home um, and you don't need to book a slot to go and collect those. And there's also a question that asks um, whether, order, uh, whether lateral flow tests can be ordered and done online. The ordering, can that be done online? Um, 
I, I'm not quite sure about that one. I can certainly find out uh, and get back to you. Um, certainly, if you're an employer and you employ more than 50 members of staff, you can actually um, go um, uh, and get your own uh, test kits uh, for your own staff and, and, and give them out. Um, but for, as I say, for smaller um, employers, you know, we're just recommending staff to go along uh, to either Apex House to, to have the, the test done, or as I say, now collect their own uh, L, uh, LFT kits uh, from Carpenters. And I think they'll be available from pharmacies as well soon, but at the moment, the, the, there's, there's not much take up on that. Um, so okay. that, you know, they'll be more widely available. Thank you. And just one final question has come in is, do you know what the process is for booking into the Apex? Um, oh, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I think it is very straightforward. I think you probably go on to um, the, the council website, I would have thought. Um, OK. But I, again, I will check and I'll, I'll see if I can find out now and I'll, I'll put it in the chat if I can, I can find That's out before wonderful. the end of the session. Thank you so All much, right. Suzanne. Thank you. OK. Sorry, Suzanne, I've got one more question. Yes, uh, certainly. You're still there. Um, with the requirement to um, uh, have uh, all of the windows and doors open, that's going to be an issue for offices as well as uh, retail premises as they start to welcome people back in. Um, has the council got any plans to, uh, well, I don't know how to say this nicely, put any further controls in place so that the very loud busking that we get complaints about from shops who say, I have to shut my door uh, because the buskers are so loud. Um, so can I just flag that as an issue that is potentially going to arise as a part of that? And would you mind taking that back for us? I certainly will, yes. Um, uh, I'll see what I can do. <laughs> All right, thank you. Thank you. Um, sorry, um, uh, one other question, Suzanne, sorry. All of that information, um, would you mind sending us a link? Um, and then um, we'll put that out in our general bid communications so that yes, find this um, if they want to go back and have another look. Um, yeah. Okay. So now um, with this lovely picture that's popped up on our screens, um, it, it looks very relaxing. <laughs> um, I'd like to hand over to um, one of our really important partners, which is um, Catherine Davis, who, uh, are you, have you got your new name yet? Are you still visit? you tell us where you're from, um, oh. who's responsible for tourism and, uh, and in particular um, developing the opportunities around the Bridgerton effect. And um, thank you so much for bringing this set slides. My pleasure. Um, just to give you a little bit of background, we're in the process of developing a new regional destination management organisation for the West of England. Uh, that's picking up Bath and North East Somerset, Bristol, South Gloucestershire, North Somerset. Um, that process has been, it feels like it's been going on for a long time, but really not as long as we think. Um, and uh, we should, that should be reaching a conclusion fairly shortly. Um, my official title, if you like, is Director of Tourism. And it's been my absolute pleasure to spend a lot of the last six months getting excited about Bridgerton before we've ever even seen it. Um, in trying to inspire others to be excited about Bridgerton and then dealing with the tsunami of inquiries and interests that have come as a result. So, I'll, you know, if we can move on to the next slide so we don't have to sit and watch people lie back and eat chocolates. Um, I just wanted to start by giving you a little bit of background in, in screen tourism. And screen tourism is a phenomenon that's been around for a while. The last big piece of research was done in 2016, um, which was reported then in a BFI, um, BFI report in 2018 that shows that film related tourism is worth just under 600 million. Um, now I would estimate that since 2016, that figure has gone up considerably. We've got things like the Game of Thrones phenomena in Northern Ireland. In fact, Northern Ireland themselves have a, have a great um, resource on, on screen tourism in their business support, um, it, it, through their business support. And it's impacted not just on destinations, but um, such as cities or counties, as I've put here, but also individual locations, particularly around Highclere Castle. 
And the reason I've highlighted Poldark and, and Broadchurch in, in, in this slide is because a lot of the filming for, for both Poldark and Broadchurch didn't actually take place in these destinations. And what's interesting about this is that it didn't matter how much filming was done in the west of England, Poldark was synonymous with Cornwall and, and Broadchurch with West Dorset. And I think what I find interesting about um, Bridgerton is that Bath is masquerading as London, but has done an incredible job of maintaining a presence of Bath, which isn't normal um, when you're looking at how these things work. So on to the next slide. Now, this, this is terribly technical, but when we were looking at Bridgerton and the opportunity it provided, it, it made sense to kind of put some order into it because you have to start somewhere, um, despite this being um, a secular cycle. Now we had our partners uh, from Visit Bath um, and th these aren't all the partners because we've worked with so many people, but these were the specific ones that were, were important for us. So obviously the film office and working in partnership with the film office and through them developing a, a relationship with Netflix. With Bridgerton, if it was successful, of course, was the first in, in eight books, I think. So we were looking at this being the start of a phenomena and we really didn't want to mess it up on, in the first series. So there was a lot of uh, backwards and forwards with Netflix over what we could and couldn't say, um, over images we could use and how we could share information. Um, the starting point for us was again about the key location sites. That came from dialogue with Netflix and the film locations. And it was making sure that those locations knew what the opportunities were, what we were saying. So, so they were critical in, in the start of this. And also, um, we lobbied Visit Britain really, really hard, and, and I'll come on to that process um, in a second. But where we started was you have to start somewhere. So we started to create the content based on what we have from the film office, what we have from Netflix and the locations. And we used that then to lobby people like Visit Britain and the trade, hoping that would drive demand, that we could then come back to more local businesses and say, well, this is what the industry is looking for, um, which then provided inspiration to come and book. So on to the next slide. And like all, all good DMOs, we measure our outputs, but we had an additional challenge. So how, how can you make the best use and take advantage of what became the world's biggest TV show when it's being broadcast at a time that no one could travel? And this, you know, this is obviously a, a difficult sticking point. And it was at a time when we were building up to this that people could still travel to Bath, but that, that kind of not just the international side but the domestic side was shrinking. So we focused really on, on our strategy was let's develop as much media coverage as we possibly can, and that's earned media, not paid for. Um, Netflix did a lot of obviously did a phenomenal amount of work themselves, um, and there was there was work that we undertook specifically and with them and with colleagues at Visit England. Um, how can we create this content? And again, hoping that, you know, series one would be successful, that we could drive them what we call evergreen content. There is evergreen content on the Visit Bath site around screen tourism and, and location inspired visits, but how big or small this um, Bridgerton content would be would, would really come from the success of the program itself. This was very much about inspiring future visits. So we weren't talking about you need to come and see this now is when you're when it's safe to travel. And through that, we can develop new bookable itineraries and experiences that we can then use to, to measure output. So all of these things became measurable outputs, which helped us kind of equate both the value of ourselves and the value of Bridgerton. So what was important to start with is um, good old IMDB. And for those of you who haven't used IMDB, I can't praise it highly enough. Um, it's a great resource center and one that we always use when a new program is being developed. So we started by looking at where, um, where Bridgerton was gonna be broadcast. Now, all of these locations of where, um, or where Bridgerton was broadcast on the same day, 25th of December, 2020. So this is where we started our targeting. So we approached the, the Visit Britain offices in the majority of those overseas territories saying, we have something really exciting coming. We put together a toolkit um, and shared some information with them. And this was primarily, as I said, to, to develop um, digital content and to develop 
earned media. So on to the next slide. Now, some of this was produced prior to Bridgerton being broadcast. Uh, Radio Times did some features. Um, the one on the left of your screen is um, iNews. Uh, we also looked at stuff that came straight after um, straight after the broadcast uh, on Christmas Day, when it started broadcast on Christmas Day. So we have content here that was produced from Cosmopolitan Magazine, Condé Nast, but, but there is a big long list of stuff that we managed to generate um, coverage of both before Christmas and, and as I said, the, the tsunami that came after. Uh, and on to the next slide. We worked really closely, as I said, with the Visit Britain offices overseas. And one of the most successful partnerships with, was with um, the team in the Americas. So Brazil generated a huge amount of content. As you can see, this is some of the examples that we worked with them on. And the next slide, uh, which shows some of the Canadian work um, that we undertook. And the next one, USA. And I think our, our favorite part of the content that was produced with the US in the USA and with the Visit Britain team was Access Hollywood, uh, which is major coverage across the country. And there was a lovely little slot, which I think you can find on YouTube um, that had the little feature about Bath uh, and Bridgerton in, in that. So on to the next slide. This is just from the Americas. So these are the incremental impressions and the how the content was shared across the social channels. And it's really quite phenomenal. Um, worked on a lot of um, screen tourism projects over the years. Nothing has even come close to this. So this is, you can see the interest here. So through the development of the, um, of the media interest and the digital interest, we've been able to develop products and go back and work with the travel trade. But now just looking at some of the European coverage, um, onto the next slide. This is an example of some of the European coverage that we've had, France, Norway, Spain, Netherlands. In fact, we've received our first um, Dutch inquiry about Bridgerton on um, Boxing Day, which just shows that somebody burned through almost the entire series on Christmas Day and, and were desperate to find out more. And onto the next slide. So through all this earned media, it was important that we capitalized on this ourselves. Um, as I said, we'd started a small Bridgerton um, section on Visit Bath located within the Inspire Me section. To start with, this was just looking at locations. Um, we've added to this now so that you have um, some examples of behind the scenes, both in terms of uh, a small film that um, ironically was shot at Lee Court, I think, um, on, in North Somerset. Um, but we've also enhanced this with some of the um, information and the breaks and experiences that have been developed through the lovely innovative businesses in Bath. And also our own team have developed um, a 360 Google Earth tour, which if you haven't had a chance to go on and play with it, it's really good fun. And it just shows you the breadth of the filming locations in Bath and how it, it really has got a point of reference across the city. So in terms of what we've been working to develop and give people an outlet really, um, we've looked at planning an, a Bridgerton inspired stay. Now this was really important because what we don't want is for Bridgerton to become um, another reason for people to do a, a short day trip into Bath and disappear again back to London. This is very much about motivating people to come and stay. And this has come through some of our work in the trade but also to, to really kind of promote the fact that if you want a real Bridgerton experience, then of course you have to stay in Bath to have it. So we've been looking at some of the opulent um, uh, guest houses and, and hotels in the area that kind of fit that brief. And the next slide. And then we have the offers and the special breaks that have been created from, again, from some of the properties um, in the Bath area. So there's three that we have at the moment, um, although I know we're adding to it all the time. So wonderful, um, live like a Bridgerton, uh, stay at the Royal Crescent, 
um, Brooks Guest House have an inclusive walking tour, and the Francis Hotel signature cocktail, entry to number one present and a themed afternoon tea. So you can see how people are working together across the city to help maximize um, the, the length of stay and the experience that Bridgerton brings. And then we have the tours themselves. So we've seen tours that have been developed by Blue Badge Guides. Um, we have walking tours. We have Bridgerton Sites and Music Tours. And it's great to be included in the Brit Movie Tours program. And Brit Movie Tours is an important one. Um, they have a loyal audience. Um, they also have tours from people who will follow different productions. So you can find the Peaky Blinders, you can find, um, there's a Sherlock tour, there is um, a Many Fools and Horses tour. So there's a number of them that operate around the UK. And I think the exciting thing for us is that it puts Bath on the pro, it puts Bath on their, um, on their distribution platform. So not only does it inspire people, particularly from Bridgeton, but those who have a more general interest in screen tourism itself. Now, as I said, it was really important not just to make sure that this information was available for consumers, although again, it will be really important for domestic visitors, in the, particularly in the short term. What we wanted to do was to maximize how we can work across the travel trade. So the travel trader, the professional, um, the professional infrastructure that sits behind the travel industry, uh, both in the UK and overseas. And we have a really structured program of how we work with the trade. And that's through um, domestically based DMCs. So these are destination management companies who put together itineraries and work with local suppliers and destinations such as, us, as ourselves to create the programs that are then distributed onward um, in different territories around the world. And it was really important for us to make sure that we connected this trade activity. And again, this is for two reasons. One of which, again, is to bring in that stay in Bath. Also, it gives us an opportunity to work with lo local suppliers and connect them to the trade in a slightly different way. Also, this is a really important way of encouraging stays, when I say off peak, looking at how the, the, the year is gonna unravel so looking at where we can motivate stays, maybe Monday to Wednesday, or when things aren't looking so busy for businesses as we start to move out of this, by promoting the Bridgerton themed stays, both domestically and internationally during an off peak period, means you're giving people reasons to visit, not just at busy times, because there's no value in, in making, you can't make a busy period even busier. We can't just kind of, pop new rooms on the side of properties. This is very much about using this phenomena to drive business where it's needed. Now, interestingly, we, can you, sorry, can you go back a, back of one? Thank you. Um, we, recently we undertook a, a, an event called Explore GB. Explore GB is Visit uh, Britain's flagship trade event. And that's where you have one-to-one -one meetings and it would normally take place um, in, a, in a banqueting hall or, or a conference centre. Now, this year, obviously, it was um, virtual, which meant that we were starting a lot earlier than normal and finishing a lot later. As we started with our, our China and India appointments, moving into Europe, then USA, with Australia and New Zealand really at kind of either end of the day. Um, in the four days of Explore GB, I had 124 meetings, and my guess is 120 of those featured Bridgerton, if not for the travel trade themselves, but for the people who I was having a meeting with who wanted it just for themselves, who wanted to see. So this is something that is genuinely of interest um, internationally. Also, the one thing that we didn't bank on was the demand from the business events sector. So um, for those of you who don't know, in February, we launched the um, Meet Bristol and Bath Convention Bureau. So that's a regional convention bureau whose role it is to bring and develop new conference and business events um, into the, the Bristol and Bath area. Now, they had a similar event. The, the travel trade event that I attended at Explore GB is almost exclusively leisure. 
uh, from the Convention Bureau side, it's almost exclusively business events. And there's a demand again from that business event sector and the incentive sector wanting to have some kind of social program or can they tag on um, a, a bridge from walking tour. So we're already seeing that leak from the, the leisure market into the business event market. Um, sorry, you can, you can kick on now. So this is an example of one of the DMCs that we're working with, Tours International. Um, somebody we know really well through our work with UK Inbound. They were one of the first off the mark really to come out with the Bridgeton tour. And again, we, we were helping them with images. We were putting them in contact with people. And so we're hoping that when business starts to, um, to happen again, uh, particularly internationally, that organizations like this will be able to use these tour programs um, to, to motivate people to come to Bath, not just to, not just to do the Bridgeton thing, but obviously to experience the other attractions in Bath, to get people to stay here overnight so they go out and dine, to attend events. So this becomes a trigger to bring hopefully new audiences in, not just people who would have been here before. So I've talked about outputs. Um, the other thing that we, we, we love filling in on evaluation forms is the outcomes. So this is where we hope to go. Um, again, the audience development inspire those who maybe haven't considered Bath as a place to visit. To, to come and, and, and try the city, or as a way for people who visited before to come back and, and discover new things. Bridgerton is, is like a, having a new museum or, or a, a new visitor experience. And it's one that you know that there's a number of series to come, um, even without the Duke, there'll be a number of series to come. Um, so it will be something that isn't a, a short-term phenomenon, but, but grows over time. This improving productivity, again, encouraging stays and longer stays and motivating the off-peak travel, and also making sure that we're ready for the return of international visitors. We'll know a little bit more um, with the result of the Global Travel Task Force next week, and a little bit more as time goes on as we look towards the 17th of May. We don't know how the landscape is, is going to look, um, Last year, we were talking about Europe first with, with USA taking longer to recover. That's now almost looking completely the reverse. But what we want to do is when those international visits are ready to return, we give them more reasons to come. And also not just um, Bridgerton, but really raising the profile of screen tourism opportunities. Now, what was quite interesting is the weekend that McDonald and, and Dodd screened. Actually, we had more people reading the McDonald and Dodd blog on Visit Bar site than Bridgerton. So it, there you go. It's not just Bridgerton that will inspire people to travel. It gives us an opportunity to go back to some of the dramas that were filmed here previously, Vanity Fair, for example, which is available on, on, on demand, um, looking at what's to come. Um, and again, hopefully at some point, the third episode of McDonald and Dog, because, because people love it and, and they love to see them. They love to see destinations that they love on screen. And it genuinely does inspire people to come and visit. So um, I think that's me. Um, and happy to take any questions uh, that anyone might have about how to get involved, what they need to do or, or where to go with Bridgerton. We haven't had any questions during the conversation, but we have got a number of um, hospitality venues in the room. Uh, well, I noticed Ben Danielson um, was, is in the room, but he's obviously already got his Bridgerton experience taped up over at the Royal Crescent. Um, but um, do feel free if you've got any questions or if they occur to you. Are you staying with us, Catherine, for a bit longer? Yes, I, I'm going to stay here. So if anybody wants to drop any questions in, then I'm happy to pick them up. Um, just as an example of, of where this is going, I'm actually delivering a presentation on Thursday to 80 French tour operators and travel agents about Bridgerton. Um, so I can't do the Q and A in French; it's not that good. But I've, I've learned my um, I've learned my presentation. So it, these things will pop up all the time, and you never quite know what the next 
the, the next market excitement happens to be. But I think, you know, from, from our point of view, Bridgerton has been a, a massive boost at a time we needed it. But not just that, you know, we've talked a lot about Mary Shelley's, um, Mary Shelley's House of Frankenstein opening up. Um, we've talked about some of the new um, tours that are, that are taking place. We've done a lot of work on the US Connections project um, during lockdown. So there's been a, a huge amount of activity taking place, whole new sections of websites delivered. So um, yeah, if anyone does have any questions about this or anything else, um, feel free to drop it in the chat or drop me a line. We have got one question, Catherine. Um, uh, do you know when season two is starting to film? Um, it's, it's been said that it's filming now, or it's about to commence filming now. They've had some changes in, um, in the talent that, that have been publicized over the weekend. Um, in terms of when it comes to Bath, I, I, I don't have that information. Or if it comes to Bath, I don't have that information. I'm afraid. Thank you. It's great to hear about um, Bridgerton. It's very exciting. Okay, so um, I, I'd now like to introduce um, Kevin, who's going to take us on a different sort of exciting journey, um, uh, focusing on a whole different sector. One of the brilliant things about my job is that I get to work with businesses across all of the sectors um, and something like a quarter, um, less than that, a fifth of our members uh, are from the uh, kind of office sector. And, um, and obviously linked to that is our very close relationship with uh, Bath Spa University in particular, um, with having um, one of the professors on our board. <coughs> and so I'm absolutely delighted to um, share or to give Kevin the opportunity to share with you the work that he's been doing, which is all about shouting about um, some of the other successes of Bath, which have more relevance in, in other sectors. So Kevin, over to you, thank you. Uh, thanks, Alison. Um, so obviously you've seen a, a sudden shock of change of image from um, the beautiful heritage of Bath to the bright green of Bath Unlimited, and, and that was done really for, for very much a purpose. So if I just give you a quick background, um, this came out of, the Economic Recovery Board that was set up last year by Baines and I was luckily invited to be a member as is David and a few other people on on the webinar and and one of the things that's always intrigued me about Bath is you've got these amazing companies but nobody seems to know all of them some of them any of them or and if they do they they certainly don't know their stories and it, it came up in one of the board meetings, if I can give a quick anecdote, about um, Everton Football Club are just having their new regeneration project on the Merseyside. It's regenerating the whole of the Docklands with a fantastic new eco-friendly stadium. And Borough Happold from Bath designed that. And when I was talking about it at the Economic Recovery Board, which is mainly obviously councils, but people like David and other people from industry, um, everybody said, wow, didn't know Borough Happel designed stadiums? And it was like, well, yeah, they did the Tottenham Stadium, which is generally seen as being possibly the most modern and dynamic sporting stadium uh, in the world, potentially. And they said, wow, they did Tottenham. How did they get the Tottenham? Well, because they did the Olympic Stadium. And then people said, what, Borough Happel designed the Olympic Stadium? Um, and then it turned out they did the Millennium Stadium and so on and so on. And that, and that was an example of effectively 30 people who are all very close uh, to businesses in Bath, not really realising the potential and the fact that Borough Happel, not only are we very proud of them being based in Bath, but they're global leaders, not only just in architecture and design of built environment, but they're global leaders in things specific as sports stadiums. And so that was the sort, the genesis of the idea of saying, how can we really try and promote these? And does Bath really need another brand? You know, there's lots of different brands in Bath. There's lots of different people trying to promote different areas. And we felt, a group of us, that there was an opportunity to try and curate this a bit more, to try and really talk about the exceptional businesses uh, and businesses that were joined together in a slightly different way about how they think and what they what they want to do and how that benefits for Bath. So we launched Bath Unlimited on the 1st of October last year. So it's just past six months. 
um, of being in existence. And, and what we wanted to try and do was really showcase the, the different businesses so people could get a real feel for them. And there's a number of objectives. So if we can go to the next slide. So as you can see, we, we've currently got, we've got a few more businesses on there since I did this slide last time, but we've got five sectors that we picked and we wanted to pick sectors to highlight first that weren't the traditional ones you thought of Bath. So we've got something called built and natural environment. So you can see under there, Borough Happold, FCB, Imagination, uh, and various other ones. We also wanted to highlight the fact that Bath and surrounding areas have got a defence industry. So Avon Rubber, BMT, but also a business horseman group who make a lot of stuff for armoured cars based um, right in the middle of Bath with a factory employing over 100 people. Again, not particularly well known. We wanted to talk about some of the consumer areas, so Pure Planet, uh, Inspects, uh, Future. Um, all these firms are contributing things, and obviously we've got other firms like Love Honey on there now as well. Bath's got a huge financial services business. Um, there's lots of IFAs, there's lots of other businesses connected to financial services. We've just picked, in this case, LNC Mortgages, which is the national mortgage broker leader. So more mortgages pass through them than anybody else. And just for profile, again, David Hollingworth, who's the main PR person, he was all over the weekend news talking about how mad the mortgage market is at the moment with people buying houses before stamp duty collects. And he's a, he's a positive face for Bath, constantly being out there and saying that we're in this market. And then there's Novia, who have just been sold, but also other people like Eccentric as well, who are very big. And then we've got a great tech and innovation hub as well. So people like um, Zanstra, who are connected to retail, so they make point of sale systems. And they were, re they were bought uh, about 18 months ago by NCR, huge American organization. Um, why is that important? Going back to the tourism thing, they have become a center of excellence for the coding they do worldwide for NCR. So they bring over people continuously from around the world, not only to look at the nice bath things, but also to look at how they can learn from the coders at Zanstra. We've put the university in there because we believe it's not just a university, it's got a lot of um, ways of talking about new developments and incubating new businesses. Uh, Road Talk, obviously the biggest business uh, effectively in Bath uh, and, and obviously innovative diet dynamic business like Rocket Maker. So what we're trying to do in Bath Unlimited was show you've got all these businesses you might not have heard of, you might have heard of a few, but they're all amazing. And the sectors, there are these five sectors that you traditionally wouldn't associate with Bath. So why is that important? Well, one of the reasons is we want to attract new businesses to Bath to help Bath keep growing. And just as Catherine's talked about the international side, we want to try and get people to understand that Bath is a great place to do business as well. So we're, really interestingly, um, there was a survey done uh, last year about the world's best small cities and Bath came 17th, but it was the number one city in the UK. And it was about a great place to live, but also a great place to work as well. So with the 17th best city in the whole of the world for having this combination of great work, entrepreneurial mindsets, as well as obviously a great environment as well to be put together. And that's what we're trying to showcase in um, Bath Unlimited. We're not trying to crowd it with every single business in Bath. We're trying to be selective to work with people to showcase their stories. And if you go on the website, um, sorry, if you can go to the next slide. Um, and what we tried to do with each of these businesses is we tried to say we didn't want to have hundreds and hundreds of businesses on there to make it look like the yellow pages or a directory. We wanted to try and pick ones that really gave an essence of what we thought the Bath Unlimited brand was about. So we called that about ambition. Um, so we have just got one called Shake Up Cosmetics, which is founded in Bath 
and is currently doing male cosmetics. And it is now the third best-selling cosmetic brand, believe it or not, in China. Um, so that set real raw sense of growth that some firms have. The sense of innovation, um, coming up with continuously new ideas. So again, Grant Associates have developed the, the Singapore Skywalk that I know a lot of people have seen. In fact, what was interesting during the projects as we're developing it, everybody had said, oh my God, Singapore Skyway, I've seen that, but I had no idea it was designed in Bath. So those type of success stories were really important for us to associate them with Bath, even if people hadn't seen them before. The sense of potential that these firms are growing, they're still expanding, and they've got new ideas. So Future, um, based in Bath, has just bought Go Compare, the, the website, website comparison site, which again, I think surprised a lot of people that they could be uh, buying companies like that and growing that way. And some of the other potential is uh, things like Inspects, which floated on the stock market last year, uh, for the first time, based in the middle of Bath, just opposite Green Park. And, and that's basically be classed as one of the top share price performers um, this year. The share price, if you're lucky enough to buy it, last January has gone up 75%. But also they've been buying German companies and other companies, so constantly expanding from their Bath base and, and with the potential of bringing international people to Bath. And the thing we also wanted to make sure was that people had a real sense of talent, that they were really developing their people, they cared about their people. And a good example of that is Pure Planet, the renewable energy firm in Bath. They are up for employee uh, of the year, uh, a major employee awards at the moment. And again, if they win it, that'd be great kudos for Bath about the types of things that we want people to have a great work-life balance. So. What we've tried to do with the unlimited thing is to say when people contact us, so can we be showcased on there? Is yes, we want to grow it and get as many firms as we can, but these are some of the criteria that we need. So it's selective to highlight the really best and some of the exceptional stories that are happening in Bath now. Next slide, please. So we've built a website and that's been thanks to a Bath-based agency called Mitten Williams. Um, and we've invested a lot of time and money in trying to make sure that it works and it's enjoyable. So when you click on the pictures that you see, you go through to a detailed case study and you can learn more about what the firm's about, but also what they contribute to the bar, their local charity oblig uh, obligations, anything they're involved in. And, and hopefully it gives people a real sense that if they, even if they had heard some of these firms, they, they really didn't know maybe some of the depth and some of the things that they're doing uh, around the world. Um, if you see format engineers at the top there with that weird picture in the desert, um, that's uh, the Burning Man Festival in California, which if you Google it, that eventually burns down, is, is very iconic. And as I mentioned, Singapore Skyway is the one in the middle of the left. Again, David Attenborough saying he thinks all cities in the future will eventually look like that with some sort of um, combination of natural environment using plants. So there's exciting stories going on in Bath all the time. One of the problems, though, is these firms are so dynamic, they're so busy, but also they're looking outside. They often don't have time to share the stories with the local media and the local press. So part of why Bath Unlimited was created was an ability to try and capture those stories um, and, and share them in this, in this way. So next slide, please. So what we've tried to do is, is to build and publicise this slowly but surely. Um, Bath Unlimited isn't paid for, nobody has to pay any money to join, uh, it's a non-profit organisation, so people give it their time voluntarily to run it, um, and you can see the fact that we've built it into lots of different avenues, we've done PR launches, uh, we've had great support, I should say, from the Bath magazine that gave us a four-page pull-out to launch it, uh, and we're getting more and more facts and more and more ideas about how to shape this and how to promote the firms. Uh, next slide, please. So social media is really important to us. So we're trying to promote all the time, the stories, 
Uh, we've got a LinkedIn page because we're focused on uh, businesses. We've got a Twitter page and we've also got an Instagram page and we share slightly different content across all of the different um, sites. And what we're trying to do is get a real balance. So you can see a picture there in the middle, hopefully of John Lennon's glasses, which was designed uh, by Bath based inspects to some other stuff that's more technical about data uh, and where we rank in the place. And we're also trying to profile some of the CEOs and some of the leaders behind those businesses as well to add a personal human element. So social media is really important for us. Um, we try and pick a firm every couple of weeks to highlight and make the whole of the social media that week around one particular firm to give them a chance to talk to their employees about it as well. And, and to grow the site. So over time, we hope this is going to help again with the international side. Um, it was very interesting. We have just completed a project with some Bath University students uh, doing their MSc and also their MBAs at University of Bath, uh, all, uh, all abroad, all foreign students, who all basically said that when they were looking for a place to come and study, uh, Bath was their natural choice, but they had no idea that Bath had these type of companies there. Uh, it wouldn't have necessarily changed their decision because they all came, but what they were saying was if they had seen this and knew about it, then they were even more likely to come to Bath. And they've all, students have contributed to our future strategy by giving us new ideas about how we can develop and how we can grow Bath Unlimited to increase both its spread of um, international recognition for Bath, but also show about the diversity of the economy that's here. Next slide, please. So one of the things we've been thinking about six months into our journey is, is where does it go? And, and David in particular has been um, really challenging us on this, uh, as well as people, Tim Keir from University of Bath, who's very involved in the project, about do we want it just to be a website platform, uh, promoting um, companies or can we add even more value and one of the things we do think we can add value is about through education about talking about the types of great jobs that there are in Bath and David's coined this phrase aspirational ambition so the fact that if we can show cases not only to other businesses but to school children and other people then there's a chance that they think that actually there's great jobs in Bath for me to stay or inspire me uh, to get some of those jobs. So whether you're a coder or you're creating great content for one of the magazines in um, Future Stable, there are all sorts of things that are happening in Bath and we need to promote those. So we have a job of the week that we highlight on the website every week and in social media. We don't want to be a jobs board, but we want to pick one that shows, look at the diversity of employment options coming up in Bath from these companies and how we can promote that uh, for Bath's sort of future focus, the jobs that are coming up in the green economy, natural built environment, and other, other technical skills that are gonna be needed for the future. So we hope the site six months on has done a great job and is, is there to promote Bath and obviously bring new businesses to Bath uh, and show that we're not only about leisure and tourism, which obviously is important, but we do have this diverse and thriving uh, economic sector. Uh, last slide, I think. And we hope that over time it's going to build with more businesses but also we can add more value to the local economy, that we can add more value with these local businesses. So when we get to 1st October, we want to run our first face-to-face -face events. And one of the reasons for doing that is to bring together all the leaders of these businesses that have never actually met each other, as well as the HR directors or other people with similar jobs who just generally can't find the opportunity to meet. Uh, for various reasons and give them a safe environment where they can talk, where they can swap ideas and actually hopefully grow together and do it. So we want Bath Unlimited obviously to keep growing, keep being unlimited in its own approach. And at the moment we're going through our own strategic process about how we develop it for the future. So any ideas or any thoughts, please let myself know or, or David know uh, and drop us a note through the website. There's a contact form on there. So um, any questions, please let me know, um, or I'll hand back to Alison now.
Thank you. Uh, we haven't had any questions in uh, while you've been talking, but it is very inspiring and um, and it's it, it it's really great that you're there reminding us uh, uh, that Bath is still a very diverse and forward thinking place. Um, uh, so thank you for that. And, and obviously, uh, you know, take up Kevin um, on his invitation to get involved. It'd be great for um, more big businesses to get involved and, and share their, their stories. Um, so we're going to move on now um, to Andrew, who, um, who works for Realm. And uh, Realm are, I, I hope I'm going to get this right, a property management specialists. So they work in places as distinct as Doncaster, Durham and Livingston in Scotland, as well as close, closer in, in, in the rest of Somerset. Um, and here in Bath, um, Realm look after Milson Place. Um, and Andy is the head of marketing and marketing communications for the for the company um, and so I feel that um, he has a, a huge amount of expertise about how you um, how you make a high street location or a business uh, uh, a kind of shopping destination successful and so I asked him to to bring his top tips um, for, for reopening uh, to give you perhaps some ideas of things that he'll be implementing or that he's seen that have inspired him. So um, I'd like to hand over to Andy, Andrew Duncan. Thank you, Alison. Uh, good evening, everybody. Um, just conscious of time, so I'll try and rattle through this. Um, but yes, Alison said some thoughts on how we respond to the easing of lockdown, and particularly after so many headlines telling us life will never be the same again, and oh, the pandemic has effectively accelerated so many trends uh, that were taking place anyway, uh, perhaps the most appropriate mantra for all of us should be that on the 12th of April, we are effectively uh, going back to the future. Uh, and the estimates that I'm referring to for how far we have actually time traveled vary from five, seven, even 10 years, all within the last 13 months. So I thought it'd be really useful because in pressing the pause button, as um, my fellow speakers just said, sometimes you don't have the opportunity in your working life to press the pause button and take stock. So thankfully, we've had the opportunity to do that, particularly as we're getting near to, to lockdown. So um, I thought I would quickly recap on what has changed so that we can take stock and sense check our response. So what, do, what have we done for the last 13 months? Well, boy, oh boy, we've used the internet quite a lot more, 40% more, in fact. And so we're currently at a staggering six and a half hours a day. Uh, two and a half hours on your phone, uh, and even the most traditional of occupiers and retailers have used their ingenuity and embraced digital, digital technology to adapt. Social media now triggers a third of online sales, and at its heart, if you think what digital is trying to achieve, ultimately it removes friction, sometimes when we don't even see it. So you may not realize, or you think Amazon, oh, it's a massive profit-making business. About $3.9 billion of its turnover effectively is invested into research and development. That's why it's so good. They've got so much money and so many very, very clever people effectively trying to make Amazon better. So as, aside from all this incredible advancement of the application of digital, we still crave experiences. And I was quite heartened really, because the most searched item last year was actually, drum roll, how to order afternoon tea for home delivery. So if you don't believe me, you can look it up on, on YouTube. So that's ultimately digital. That happened in a big way. But then also consumerism and this period of enforced lockdown where we're, ref we're reflecting on our consumer habits has ultimately made large sections and swathes of our society really question things. So at the moment, the good news is that net consumer sentiment actually recovered very quickly after lockdowns one and two. And at no point has it reached the historic low of the financial crisis. So we're not all absolutely clinging on for dear life. There is a sense of optimism. And 
if you want to target for something to go at, the households of the UK have actually accumulated a staggering £140 billion, and I love this expression, of involuntary savings. So that is money that has effectively been accumulated into people's bank accounts because their lives have not been allowed to live as they would normally. No holidays, no extravagant parties, no 18ths to pay for, no graduations, postponed weddings. So all of that money is effectively lying latent uh, and as I said it's it's a target to go at but the slight word of caution is as I mentioned enforced reflection means that we are now more mindful than ever of our own consumerism there was a phrase coined by the chief executive of IKEA ooh, probably about five or six years ago now called peak stuff I'm not sure what it translates to in uh, in Swedish so you have peak stuff where we're questioning, do I really need to buy another pair of shoes, pair of jeans? Do I really need to buy more stuff? And equally, we have new phenomena, which is the concept of screen fashion, where clothes that people have bought in the last 12 months have been the ones that are visible on Zoom. Nobody's looking at the fact that you're wearing pajamas and a pair of um, uh, cheesy slippers that your auntie gave you at Christmas five years ago. So with a greater sense of our place on this planet, uh, collectively as a society, we feel compelled to waste less and reduce the carbon footprint of our spending. So we've seen the rise of secondhand reuse and ultimately, for the short term, a diluted fashion demand. So in terms of the next slide, we've got localism. Okay, so we all shopped more locally, initially because we had to, we're following the rules, but gradually more frequently and in more places. We got bored of going to the same supermarket. We would get bored of shopping almost and buy one meal at a time from the local top-up grocery stores and lo and behold, they experienced a 15% growth. More of us would now consider spending with an independent business sourcing local ingredients or raw materials. And this is great news, particularly for a city like Bath, which is dominated by independence because they provide character, interest, stories about their, their business proprietors and local pride. And perhaps there's an argument to say there's a new definition of what essential retail really is. So in terms of, I know I hope there's no English teachers out there. I've certainly, um, corrupted the English language with some of my headings, but the UK consumer is now incredibly sophisticated, more so than ever before. We've used our increased screen time effectively to become more informed, more conscious, more, interest in, more interested in genuine promotions, hence the background to that slide, more questioning of price, more curious about brands and their provenance, and loyalty is no longer a given. So what about retail? What's actually happened? Well, there is some good news. 5,119 new shop businesses were opened last year. Wow, what a time to open a new retail business. And despite the gloom, the UK average void rate is currently 12.5%. And that is exactly the same as it was back in 2013. We need to be careful that we don't get swept up in all of the negativity and the headlines and the death of the high street, uh, because that's certainly not uh, our intention and it's certainly something within our control to do something about. But what the last 12 months has brought into perspective is the commercial model for retail property has shown itself very much in need of reform. And we're not just talking about business rates or valuations or lease structures or planning permission. It's the whole kit and caboodle. And actually, if we get to real fundamentals, the role of a shop has also changed to become a platform, blending channels in person, click and collect, online delivery, a hub, a showroom, a place to hold workshops, all of these things would never have appeared in the definition of a retail premises two, three, four, five years ago. And the change is continuing in terms of the, the nomenclature, how we refer to things. And this might be a little bit faddy, but for years now, I often have looked over the pond at America and they regard retail staff as a profession 
And in this country, we've regarded it as sometimes uh, a stopgap. It's pretty much a, a lowbrow career choice. And actually, you can see now that people are the lifeblood of a retail business. Sales assistants are set to become in-person influencers. Shoppers are guests. Tenants are brand partners. And even the use of the word footfall seems quite sort of blasé. You know, they're not statistics, they're people. We need to humanize our business much more. And even fundamentally, if you consider the term a shopping center, you could argue that's wrong on two counts. Number one, it needs to be more about more, it needs to be about more than shopping. And number two, it has no divine right for it to be at the very center and heart blood of any town or city. It only occupies 29% of the, of the high street. And the good news is that people are responding. Across Europe, there was a, a webinar a couple of days ago and some you know, the cleverest people in the retail property industry were all talking about the emerging new skills and they should be regarded not as shopping centers, but as social meeting points. And maybe we need to be thinking of operators rather than landlords. So then we come to the, uh, the ultimate question, what will happen in the next six months? Well, I can tell you there are some very positive signs. Uh, the Southwest stacks up very well. And by the time we reach Christmas, 75% uh, uh, of people in the Southwest are very confident that things will be back to normal. I'm sorry to use the N word, um, but uh, it is good news. Yes, there are many challenges ahead, high streets, city centers and towns, uh, but they are receiving more proactive attention than ever before. So what should we do while we await the cavalry is the question. Well, clearly, if you're opening up your retail business, I think first and foremost, we have to remind ourselves that safety first. We heard the, the reminders about social distancing, about uh, signage to remind people to still wear face coverings. But whilst that is still relevant, the tone of voice can definitely change. I would urge people to try and humanize the messaging. A lot of the, the initial point of sale that went out was very alarmist, black and yellow, very do this, don't do that, ordering, instead of perhaps softening it a little bit. We've got used to the pandemic now. So I think there's a, an argument to say a please and a thank you and a welcome and would be very much appreciated. These are the languages that we need to be, uh, to be using. So I would urge everybody to almost try and do um, an audit, try and do something that's very hard as a business owner and think in the eyes and the persona of your shoppers. Clearly, I would like to expect almost um, that everybody could try and update your online presence. Make your customers say, oh, that's a good idea. Email receipts is a brilliant way of building a database instead of handing over a piece of paper. Appointment booking. This has been adopted the world over. Even luxury brands like Gucci have been doing online sales consultations with WhatsApp. And that needs software that's readily available to enable you to do that. You can't have two people trying to buy for the same time. Contactless payments are pretty much a given. WhatsApp using, as I mentioned, to contact your, your, your customers. And to think of it as you are producing content. That's what digital requires, content rather than just sales messages. Apple Pay, make doing business with you as easy as possible. Make it faster than other ways of doing business. So the, the mantras for adopting digital and trying to get your head around reducing friction are number one, do it for me anticipate my needs. This is what Amazon was doing 10, 15 years ago. Then the next stage on from that is think for me. Oh, wow, yes, go, I bought that. And oh, look, I've got an e-shot. And all of a sudden it's got my likes exactly right. And this is all in pursuit of trying to make your business more resilient. So I put this slide up because I heard it on an episode of Gogglebox and it made me chuckle. So the two sisters, were talking and they said, as soon as lockdown is over, we are so going out five nights a week. And I think that is absolutely brilliant. It typifies what a lot of people are anticipating, which is this pent up 
spenders ready to um, offload some of their 140 billion. Uh, and this is really, a lot of people have been referring back to the Roaring Twenties, a time where people were enjoying uh, the relaxation um, and a much more optimistic outlook on society. So denied entertainment and experience is the number one missed activity, uh, all to do with socializing with friends. So what I would urge everybody to try and do in their, in their business is elevate what you do and try and turn it into an event. Because then all of a sudden it has a little bit more presence to it. It has an echo about it. Is it Instagram worthy? Is it worthy of telling another person, oh, I had a fantastic experience. I went into this store. I saw this being demonstrated. It's these stories that make retail uh, the word of mouth activity rather than just the pure functional activity. Functional is the internet, functional is Amazon, and we are wanting to try and provide vibrancy and vitality to our towns and high streets. So in terms of the, the, uh, the lead sisters there, no surprise that the 18 to 34 year olds are the most optimistic group about the future, certainly for the next uh, 12 months or so. Despite, and this is really the challenge, the business opportunity, the over 65s, which have for quite a while um, been the, the key holders, if you like, for the, the largest swathe of um, untapped uh, discretionary spend. Uh, and the, only 7% of the over 65s have been in any way financially negatively impacted by the lockdowns. So, <laughs> What do we do about consumerism? Well, I think in some way or other, we have to try and ease the conscience of the UK consumer. And what does that mean? Well, it means standing for something. What is your purpose? You cannot exist anymore just to sell stuff. That is the equivalent of open cast mining, trying to farm off what you believe to be your share of discretionary spend. You've got to try harder than that. We're not dealing with literally putting a net into um, a very uh, uh, fruitful ocean full of fish. How sustainable is your business going to be moving forward? Which producers should you be working with? Which charitable causes are you supporting? And the objective here is to make your business more sustainable. Many of your customers may not actually care, but at least they won't punish you for it. So I also thought of this slide. It's, um, it's actually from uh, Chicago, the musical. And the line goes, I simply can't do it alone. And so now more than ever is a time for collaboration. There's no time for adver adversarial relationships, partnership. You just have to look at some of the big names joining forces. Next, have too much space and they bought Victoria's Secret out of administration. So next, obviously saw the opportunity. What weaknesses do you have and could you extend by partnering up with other people? Flexibility is clearly required when it comes to landlords and a reminder, you cannot do this alone. The problem ultimately is too big. So the objective of partnering up is to ultimately make yours and other businesses stronger. And so finally, in this rather whistle top tour, of uh, what's going to happen, I want to leave you with a call to action to engage the task manager, if you like, in all of us by pressing three magic buttons. And that's not because our brains can't cope. We're not saying that we're all like a 20 year old laptop that's still running on uh, Windows XP, but really to recognize the three things. We can control our own actions much more easily than a global phenomena. And now really is the time to alter our thinking. And finally, to try and delete negativity. And there you go. Uh, thank you for your attention and thanks for asking me, Alison. Thank you so much. That was uh, such a lovely, positive uh, note to, to end the session on and um, uh, exactly what I hoped. <laughs> So, so thank you very much and um, lots of insight and lots of resonance with what we're trying to do in our next five year plan of the bid. So um, uh, I really appreciated that. Um, we did have a question in. Uh, David, do you want to run the questions? 
Uh, yes, absolutely, Alison. So this is actually from one of our board members. Um, so it's, uh, I'll try to try and paraphrase. So um, his observation is that a lot of um, uh, high street rate retailers have have suffered more than than out of town retailers, so shopping centre retailers, for example, where it's easier to park. Um, and so, so his concern is that road restrictions, which have been enthusiastically introduced by a lot of council, but but in particular in in Bath, arguably inhibits um, the uh, uh, consumers coming in to to shop in in in, in Bath. And, and have you any thoughts about how we address that sort of challenge, bearing, bearing in mind that it is politically quite central? Yeah, that's a tough question, David. I would I, say I, um, I would probably remind people that part of the success of retail parks, certainly in the last 12 months, is the fact that the majority of them do have a Boots, a Marks and Spencer, a B&M Bargains, a Range, and, they, and a Garden Centre, B&Q, and they have all been classed as essential retail. So there's no surprise that they have continued to uh, power on, also pets at home. So it's almost the ideal hand. Uh, and also retail parks have really come about uh, as the antithesis of everything that's bad about a city in terms of pollution, in terms of the ease of getting in and out on the way to uh, home or on the way to work even. So I think ultimately buying or um, buying a shopping centre in a city centre location has been quite lucrative from a parking point of view. And I think certainly for our more urban schemes, we have been pretty aggressive on our um, price promotion for car parking, certainly to incentivize and to try and look at the tariffs so that people coming in um, are not feeling aggrieved uh, that they're being taken advantage of. So I, I do feel that uh, whilst we still have a large proportion of um, uh, non-electric vehicles, uh, I, do, I do feel that the future of cities does need to be much greener and much less about coming in uh, on a, you know, a, a carbon generating vehicle. Thank you for the answer because of, a, of, of an internet um, issue, but that was re um, uh, very, very, very helpful. Um, and, and, and I think I think I agree with you as well. And I think the importance of getting town and city centres right is about making sure that there's there's a, a much broader experience to enjoy. So it's not you're not coming to the centre just just for the just for the retail um, experience, but of course people will want to shop if there are other good reasons yeah. to come into the centre. Okay. Well, thank you again for uh, inviting me, and uh, I wish everybody the best of luck. And that includes my colleague Andrew at uh, at Milson Place, which is obviously where. Uh, uh, where, where I'm linked with uh, with the city. So thank you again. Thank, and uh, Thank you very I'm, much. I've got a bailout now. So thank you very Enjoy much. Enjoy your evening, everybody. Thank you. Okay, uh, we don't seem to have any other questions. Oh, there was an earlier question about the tap to donate point and how successful it had been. Um, and um, in answer to your question, I can't remember the figures off the top of my head, unfortunately, um, and I have looked, but they're buried in an email. It was very successful when we first started, and obviously with the reduction in numbers of people, um, it was sort of at the £100 a day level when we first started, but in the reduction of numbers of people in, in the city, um, there's been a lot less tapping. Um, so um, it's definitely something that... Um, we want to promote the one that we've got at the nationwide and make it um, more of a feature of, 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 you know, of the city so that people can um, donate their money in a way that they can feel confident about. Um, so I hope that answers the question. Um, I can double check the figures though, and we'll put it in the next newsletter. <laughs> OK. So, Alison, I don't, don't think there are any more questions. Um, so, I, 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 so that just sort of leaves um, leaves us really to 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 thank again all our, our presenters who have um, 
uh, contributed uh, enormously, I think, to uh, a really interesting dialogue. I said at the start, you know, I think we've got reason to be optimistic about the future for Bath and all our presenters have, have helped to confirm that. Um, and, and that takes nothing away from the fact that, you know, a number of businesses will face challenges as, as Bath um, re reopens. Um, and, and of course the bid will, 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 will play its part in, in supporting the, those businesses. Um, and, um, you know, and I like the, like the fact that um, the, uh, the, the, the great information about tourism, the, the Bridgerton effect, you know, that should give that should give us cause for a lot of optimism about visitors that will come to Bath. It should boost retail as well as the as the hospitality um, uh, sectors. It was great to hear from Kevin um, just as a really important reminder that, you know, we do have a diverse uh, uh, economy and, and there must be scope for um, the, the bid to work with um, the Bath Un Unlimited to, to help um, you know, promote the fact that um, Bath is a great place to do business. You know, and uh, there are a number of those Bath Unlimited companies that sit within the, um, the, the bid, bid zone. Um, and, and simply encouraging this kind of network, this kind of networking, this kind of um, informa information exchange. I, I think does service to those kinds of um, uh, companies. So, um, so that's been really helpful, and great to get advice from uh, and Andy too um, for so many of our, our businesses that operate in in, in the centre. I think I think that's been a really helpful um, evening. I hope you've enjoyed it. So, on behalf of um, uh, the, the the bid board, thank you very much. Yes, thank you.